Welcome to the Sports Playbook, where we discuss solutions to issues that impact sports. I'm your host, Angela Hazlett. Today's guest is Guy Debrun, a guide for Blue Ridge Mountain Guides. Today, we are going to discuss rock climbing safety, conquering the heights. Guy, thank you for joining us today on the Sports Playbook. Thanks, Angela. Happy to be here. I want to hear all about your rock climbing experience. So start us back when you first got involved with the sport and what led you to where you are today. Yeah, so um, my father worked at uh, Eastern Mennonite University in Harrisonburg, Virginia, and they offered um, a rock climbing class through their physical education department. And I was home uh, for a summer and I took the class as a uh, summer you know, a couple credit course uh, as an introduction. And so I was introduced starting with some indoor climbing and learning the ins and outs of how to tie the knots and et cetera. And then we went out on several different um, outdoor climbs as part of that course, culminating in an opportunity to climb at Seneca Rocks in West Virginia. So my introduction was a, a uh, credit course through a, a, a summer class. And then I got really interested from there and started traveling to climb all throughout the Northeast. And how old were you when you first started? So I must have been oh, around 20, I guess. Um, this was before the summer before my senior year of college. Uh, and and so I haven't looked back from that. Um, lots of recreational climbing throughout the Northeast and various other countries, but also an opportunity to do some training with the American Mountain Guides Association. So some uh, formal training in addition to sort of the more traditional informal mentorship with with another more experienced climber. Tell me a little bit about the the training that you've gone through to become credentialed to lead and guide others in rock climbing. Yeah, so the guiding industry in the United States is interesting. It's not as uh, regulated or as um, sort of ingrained in the culture as it is in Europe, um, France, for example. Um, but we we it is emerging in the United States, and so I started with taking uh, a course in Joshua Tree National Park, um, a couple hours from Los Angeles, um, over a spring break called it, at the time called the Top Rope Site Manager Course. So that was um, designed for um, institutional type guiding, like the, what I was doing in my career at the time. I did 18 years of managing uh, campus recreation outdoor programs. And so that included overseeing climbing walls, as well as training students to lead their peers on rock climbing trips. And so when we talk about top roping, we're talking about a situation where the the belayer is on the ground and the anchor has been set up at the top of the cliff and the run rope runs back down to the ground. Um, and so everybody's at, at the same place um, as far as starting on the ground, climbing up and then lowering. So that course was designed to teach all the inside, uh, all the ins and outs of building anchors. And when I say anchors, that's securing the rope to the rock um, and all the techniques around uh, around top rope climbing. That course is now known as the single pitch instructor course uh, because now it includes starting from the ground and leading up uh, and building an anchor at the top and bringing someone up to you perhaps. Uh, and then I went on and did um, the rock instructor course, which was, I wanna say that was uh, at least the eight or 12 day course. And that was designed for more, what we call multi-pitch terrain. So in other words, now we're climbing higher than one rope length above the ground. Uh, and so it's a lot more technical. So those are the two courses that I took. Would you say that the top rope or the single pitch is kind of the typical pathway that a lot of people kind of start with rock climbing, or is there another entryway that's more common? Uh, you know, now climbing gyms have become, you know, sort of the way to get introduced to the sport. And, um, it's good and bad there. People get strong, um, and, um, you know, and they can learn some good things, but um, it's also such a different, so di it's a very different experience from climbing outdoors. And some of the hazards and and things we think about from a risk management perspective when we're climbing outdoors are just not there indoors. For example, um, you know, loose rock, right? It's extremely rare for a climbing hold to break or come off. And so um, there has, I think there has been challenges associated with so many people 
coming into the sport in a very controlled indoor environment um, and making it more difficult for them to transition outdoors where, you know, mm. I'm going to guess now it must be 40 years ago that, you know, before the climbing gyms really got going, everyone went through a mentorship with a more experienced partner in the outdoors. And so there's just a little bit of a difficulty in transition. And then the second thing I would say to your question is most people probably get into, yeah, top rope climbing, but even more common is what is known as sport climbing. And that's where you see bolts either in, on the indoor climbing wall or out on the rock that are drilled into the rock. And so as you progress, you clip um, what's known as a quick draw, which is two carabiners to that bolt and then clip your rope through that um, until you progress to the top. It's usually single pitch. So in other words, you come up to the top, clip anchors, and then you're able to lower down with a rope. Most ropes are around 60 meters, which is 200 feet, right? So we're talking about 100 foot max climbs. Um, and that's the sort of gateway is climbing in gyms, sport climbing, and, and that's where people start generally. That that is really interesting, and I believe sport climbing it sport climbing is actually now an Olympic sport, so it's going to expose even more people or make more people give more people a pathway to participate in that particular sport. Um, and so the sport climbing, someone would have to go through and kind of make those bolts. They'd have to install those bolts in advance for someone to participate. Is that correct? That's correct. The first ascensionist, um, and it's a lot of work. <laughs> Um, establishes the route by drilling um, holes, holes to insert, insert the bolts. And so, it, yeah, and, it, you know, it emerged out of Europe in the 80s. It was very controversial in the United States. Um, because of it damaging a, the environment? Is that well, what it, it does. It, but the thing is that sport climbs are established in rock that cannot be climbed in any other way. So in other mm -hmm. words, there's not enough cracks to take mm -hmm. natural climbing equipment which we call traditional climbing or tr trad climbing which um is is a cleaner form of climbing but the type of rock that um sport climbs are established on cannot be protected naturally um and so there was a lot of controversy that the ethic in the united states out of yosemite was the traditional climbing ethic where you um started at the ground and you protected by putting different equipment into cracks and went on. So it was very controversial for a while, but that controversy was pretty short lived. Now sport climbing is, is widely accepted um, in, in across the country. Um, and so, yeah, those are, we talked earlier about the disciplines, right? So traditional climbing and sport climbing are two sub disciplines of rock climbing. Um, and as you mentioned, the Olympics, has bouldering, lead climbing, which is sport climbing, clipping bolts as you go, uh, and then speed climbing. And it was somewhat controversial in that uh, for the Olympic format, you climb all three of those. But in the World Cup circuit, people specialize in one of those three. Hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. I would imagine you'd have, you have you know, strength and, and or power or speed or, you know, you don't necessarily have all those um, capabilities and it probably takes it a very different skill set. Mm -hmm. um, so that's interesting. The Tell us more about the differences. There's, there's a wide variety of different climbing uh, components or disciplines. So you mentioned a few of those, but there's also a few others like mountaineering, um, ice climbing. Can you tell us a little bit more about the differences between those disciplines? Yeah. Um... So it, let's start with bouldering, right? So bouldering is unroped climbing at generally low heights. Now, boulders have really pushed that. Um, and there's a fine line between what we call free soloing and bouldering, right? And so free soloing was obviously made very popular by the movie Free Solo, um, Alex Honnold's movie. Um, so bouldering is unroped climbing using pads. And generally, it's in the 12 to 15 foot range. But people do push that higher. Um, so that's bouldering. Um, then we go into top rope climbing. And again, that's where there's an anchor at the top um, where the rope runs up through the anchor, back down to the climber, but everybody's on the ground. Then you move to sport climbing where you're clipping the bolts as you progress up, which is um, as risk because you will fall further um, than you would on a top rope, right? Um, and then we go to traditional climbing, which is putting protecting um, the 
the rock with various metal devices and, and camming devices that you can put into cracks. Um, again, upping the risk a little bit because now you have to have the knowledge to place that equipment properly that it's going to hold if you fall. Then we'll add, um, let's see, ice climbing, right? Um, ice climbing can be done via top rope or you could lead. Uh, and then when you put all of those disciplines together to ascend big mountains, we get into what we call mountaineering. And so mountaineering is moving over snow, rock, or ice, or combinations of those things to get into the big mountains. And so um, rock climbing initially was sort of actually just kind of considered a training for mountaineering. Um, but it, be, it evolved into its its own discipline. Um, I guess the only other thing I would mention is alpine rock climbing, which is when you're far away from a trailhead and you have to hike in, you know, many miles to do a multi-pitch climb in a remote environment. That's kind of the an overview of the sub-disciplines. Definitely a lot of variety and opportunity. I'm sure the the terrain. Uh, uh, people, geographic terrain uh, obviously will dictate what's required for um, which discipline is going to be appropriate. Um, I want to go back to something you said earlier. You were talking about a lot of people are getting their start now in rock climbing gyms. Tell me a little bit about, dive into that a little bit deeper about the distinction between being in a gym. You said it's kind of this controlled environment versus being outdoors in a natural environment. What are the what are the distinctions that you see that maybe people aren't acquiring those skills in an indoor gym that they might need for an outdoor location? Well, some climbing gyms, um, a couple examples, it, the type of device that they use for what we call belaying, which is essentially holding the rope and stopping a fall, they'll use um, an auto blocking device, like what's called a grigri. Um, and so, so climbers, from gyms are only familiar with a device that is called, it's actually, it's an assisted braking device. So in other words, if you were to let go of it, it's going to, it's most likely going to stop the climber. Um, and so climbing gyms tend to favor, favor assisted braking devices for obvious reasons. It, it reduces the risk, but that they're not always practical in an outdoor setting. So now a climber may not have experience with having to completely arrest the fall um, with their own hands using, you know, something like a um, slot belay device, for example, like an ATC. So there's one example. Another example is sometimes climbing gyms will um, have you clip in with carabiners instead of tying your own knot. So so people don't get that rep repetitive experience and in, in how to tie in properly. And then you just remove lots of um, hazards, right? You remove loose rock, you remove heat and cold, you remove um, you know, snakes, bees, wasps, <laughs> et cetera. Um, so all of these hazards that are very common in an outdoor environment have been removed from the indoor environment. And so it can make it a little more challenging for people to uh, conduct themselves in a safe manner um, when they enter that less controlled environment. I imagine like being outdoors, for example, if it's cold out, your fingers might kind of cramp up and making it harder to, to grip and move um, some of those challenges. Um, in addition to kind of weather and these other natural type of uh, creatures you might encounter, or rocks breaking, what are some of the other challenges that you may face um, in climbing outdoors versus climbing indoors? Well, so another example would be the length of the route, okay? So um, you know 100% that uh, in a climbing gym, they, the rope length is appropriate to the length of the, the route, right? Um, but let's say you go outside and you don't think through that and you have, let's say, a 50-meter rope, right? But the climb, you know, which is, you know, it's fine on the way up, but then when you start lowering, you need to make sure that if that climb exceeds 50 meters and so a common accident in sport climbing is people go outside they climb to the top and then as they lower they don't realize that the climb is actually longer than the rope and so the mm. if, if you haven't tied a knot in the end of your rope it can go flying right through the blade device and and somebody could get dropped right so you know that variation in root length is is something that you don't see in the gym as much um because you know exactly how tall that climbing wall is and um so so that's one example that's really interesting and when you lead groups 
um, outdoors, how many people do you take at a time? Is there, is there kind of a limit to control and to make the environment safer? Yeah, there's definitely standards within the field and industry. Um, you know, in, in the, in the collegiate recreation field, which I worked in for 18 years, we, we worked with bigger groups and usually like a five to one ratio. So we might have two staff and 10, 10 participants out at say a top rope crag. In, in my role in, in with Blue Ridge Mountain Guides, I work with much smaller groups generally. Um, guiding tends to be one to one, two to one, maybe three to one, especially in multi-pitch terrain. I'm, I rarely would have more than two clients, um, say at Seneca Rocks, where I'm taking people up multiple rope, rope lengths. Um, so that's kind of how that works. Okay. Yeah. And I imagine it's more personalized experience. You can kind of keep a better eye on them, mm -hmm. <laughs> make sure it's a safer experience for ever, everyone. Talk to well, me yeah, about As you up the risk, you have to, um, the ratio, the client to guide ratio has to decrease. Yeah. I, I, I imagine distractions probably play into that too. The more people there are there, the more distractions there are. Mm -hmm. Do you have like a no cell phone policy when people are on trips like that? Well, we actually will take snap photos with um, cell phones, but certainly not while actively climbing or or belaying. Um, but no, we don't have a specific policy on that. We kind of have other ways of mitigating those risks. <laughs> Their hands are occupied, right? So yeah. <laughs> they're going to be busy with that. What about people with disabilities? How do you make accommodations for people that either... Um, aren't able to use all their limbs or have missing limbs or other kind of physical disabilities. And then maybe you could touch a little bit on intellectual disabilities and um, is there ways to accommodate them as well in the sport? Yeah. So um, there's two well-known climbers. One is Mark Wellman. Um, Mark Wellman, I believe is a quadriplegic, didn't have the use of his legs. Um, and he's, he's devised some techniques um, where essentially it's using somebody would lead up and then um, fix the rope so that uh, he could climb with some devices, essentially doing a bunch of pull-ups, which is quite impressive, um, on the rope itself. Um, and there's a, a variety of adaptive technologies that have been employed in climbing gyms uh to allow people to uh climb up the rope and get that same experience um as somebody who can who can climb uh in a more traditional manner um and and different programs have specialized in adaptive climbing um and then eric wayne wayne Aimer is um a visually impaired climber uh he's climbed everest uh and so again um sort of it's sort of the equipment isn't as adapted for somebody with visual impairments, but so, certainly the the ratio of the guiding and and the communication that takes place is different. So there is a um, there is re, uh, adaptive climbing. It's definitely a, a a thing, and a lot of university programs have incorporated it into their programs. You mentioned communication, and that's really key between the guide and and the person who's climbing or the participant that you're escorting. Um, talk to me about that because some, some of these participants are probably learning new vocabulary related to the sport. Um, it, they may become fearful or, you know, they may not understand commands that are given to them. Um, how do you manage the communication piece, uh, these challenges? Yeah. Thankfully, there's a fairly standard protocol um, with maybe some slight variations um, that that's taught to every climber. And so making sure people understand that is is really critical. Um, another really kind of common mistake is miscommunication, especially um, within the sport climbing realm. People get to the top of the climb and then it's unclear where they're going to where they're going to. Um, go on to the anchor and then rappel down, or were they going to get lowered? Right. So one of the, one really important piece is before you leave the ground with your partner, whether it's a guide or just a recreational environment, be clear on what you're doing. Like, okay, I'm going to go to the top. I'm going to thread the rope to the anchor, and you're going to lower me, and don't ever take me off the lay, right? Or you can take me off the lay. I'll pull the rope up, and I'm going to rappel. Just that kind of simple agreement about what's going to happen when you're 100 feet up in the air. Is really important um and then you know we use a, a very standard procedure where it's on belay right that means okay i've got you now climbing climb on 
um and that basically is a contract then like that you're gonna keep your hand on that rope until i say off belay um and so yeah making sure everybody understands the commands we're using and uh before we leave the ground and then in a multi-pitch environment i'll explain and because what happens sometimes is you get around a corner and the wind picks up and you can't hear and it's really frustrating um, some people use like communication devices like walkie talkies, but what I do is rope signals and I make it very clear to my partner or client. If you feel me tugging three times in a row, extremely hard on the rope, that means that you are, you can take me off the lay. And so those are some of the techniques that we use. That's great to have a kind of a nonverbal cues. If the, the environment doesn't allow you to communicate verbally and there's been an increase of people in the sport since COVID has happened and more people pursuing outdoor activity and many who don't have the experience or safety training in mind. Have you encountered any of people who don't seem uh, prepared to be in that environment or maybe in over their heads? And, and if you have, what, what have you done, if anything, in, in that situation? Yeah, that, that's a delicate situation because you see stuff sometimes that um maybe is just like not good technique or sort of misapplication of a technique but not necessarily immediately dangerous um and so you know you don't want there's you don't want to create some environment where people um don't feel welcome and included in the sport but at the same time there are times when if you don't speak up <laughs> it could it could result in a really bad um, accident, right? right. Um, I'll give you an example. I was at the New River Gorge guiding a couple of weeks ago, and that's um, a very popular. And I was surprised at how many people were out with their little, ki little, very little kids, like babies, which is great. But the, they don't make helmets for kids that small, and that's like rock fall is not uncommon or or something being dropped and i i shudder to think about like a little baby getting hit in the head with something um you know without a helmet and so there's like that area where you don't want to like be like well you know get out of here like it's just, <laughs> you want people to be out enjoying the sport with their families but there's mm -hmm. also maybe a lack of awareness of some of the potential um issues yeah and so just to be clear the babies are not um scaling the rock face but they are just on the ground with mm -hmm. their parent one of their parents yeah, hanging out with the kid and the the hard part too is sometimes you see like uh the partners belaying each other and then so no one can actively be with the with the little baby and um, so um yeah it's just but it's it's something that in nine out of ten times is probably going to be fine but it has a um, there's that possibility, right? And you're, mm -hmm. I know you're familiar with the idea of like frequency versus severity, right? Like how frequently do it does an accident occur and how severe when it does occur? You know, the frequency is probably pretty low there, but the severity is potentially high. Right, right. Yeah, so the, it may not happen that often, but the type of injury could be really devastating. So mm -hmm. That's a really um, interesting, interesting point. So lots of climbers out there. Do you think there's areas that are getting overcrowded, overused? That's maybe either compromising the experience or safety. Oh, sure. That's an ongoing debate within the climbing community. Um, as, as the gyms have greatly increased the number of climbers, um, there is that, 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 that debate for sure. And, you know, often the rub is the parking areas right? Lots of climbing areas are in mountainous areas where there's not a lot of real estate to work with. And so the parking areas get overrun and that causes tension with other users and within climbers. Um, also, climbing is not a very dispersed activity, right? So in other words, there's, you know, maybe there's 30 routes at one particular crag and we all want to be on those 30 routes, right? Um, and so you can't disperse all that well versus say something like mountain biking, right? There could be you know, a hundred people um, on the mountain, but in various different trails and different parts of the trails. And so it's not quite as, um, it's a little more dispersed than climbing. Um, and so, yeah, that's, that's an issue a hundred percent. 
And I imagine only one crew can be on a route at a time um, for safety reasons, but do some of the routes kind of cross over each other and that kind of eliminates the use of, of certain routes? Yeah. So for top roping, we tend to try to, you know, yeah, only one person, only one group can be on the route. Yes. Um, in the big climbs, like in Yosemite, um, multiple parties can be on a route because they're much taller, but they do intersect. And so Sometimes you'll see people like professionals that are moving extremely quickly. They'll actually pass parties. Um, but yeah, crowding crowding is an issue and there's no simple answer because you, you want to be inclusive. You want people spending time outside and enjoying natural resources and hopefully speaking up for those natural resources because they value them. Um, but at the same time, um, we 100% know that there's an impact. And so the Access Fund uh, is a climbing conservation um, organization that I would recommend everybody check out, and they provide a lot of guidance on how to minimize impacts in the climbing environment. Yeah, I am really curious. Have you either witnessed, seen, or been involved in an incident? And can you describe what that was like in in a rock climbing situation? Um, yeah, I did. Uh, I did. I was present when somebody um, took a fall, so they were lead climbing. So starting on the starting on the ground, protecting the climb naturally as they climbed up um, and they fell. And I think one of their pieces of gear popped out and they hit the ground and broke their ankle very severely. Um, and um, so I was part of evacuating that person. Uh, they were actually quite lucky in that the National Guard was at the crag that day doing some kind of training. So there was a whole bunch of National Guard folks that were able to assist in carrying that person out. Um, so that that was one particular incident that, that I did witness, yeah. National Guard got some uh, on the ground, real live uh, training there. Yeah. So um, that was fortunate for, for that individual. Um, you know, we're kind of getting to the end of our time. So Guy, I'm curious, are there any kind of final thoughts that you would share with someone wanting to get into the sport or maybe improve their skills in, in this sport? Yeah. So it's worth investing in some guiding or instruction. It's just far too dangerous a sport to kind of, um, mess around with like I, I think making that investment is is very um very important and then also you don't need to emulate uh Alex Honnold um in free solo like free soloing is a very fringe aspect of the sport and it's practiced by people who have done it for many many years and frankly most of those folks die at some point so I would just encourage people that are getting into the sport you don't need to rush into free soloing uh, there's plenty of safer ways to enjoy the sport. Absolutely. And and Blue Ridge uh, Mountain Guides is is one avenue in which people can kind of get that leadership from, from experts in the area. Well, Guy, thank you so much for, for your time today and joining us on the Sports Playbook and for teaching us about rock climbing safety and conquering the heights. Thank you. So, I uh, really enjoyed talking with you. I appreciate your time and, and expertise. We learned a lot today. Thank you for our viewers for joining us. We'll see you next time on the Sports Playbook. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please click the like and subscribe button on YouTube. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. Check out our website, thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.